thanks everybody. Sorry for the short delay in getting started. Welcome. This is the Open Research Institute FPGA meetup. Uh, it's on a Thursday instead of a Tuesday this week, but we do try to move it around and do different time zones for accommodation. Today is the 7th of December, 2023. And what we're going to do is talk about the HIFRIA update. This is our main transponder project, uh, broadband, microwave, open source, uh, transponder for space and terrestrial use. And we have some, some things that have happened over the past week, and we're going to talk about what we're going to do over the next week. In this meeting, we also discuss roadblocks, uh, if we are facing them, and uh, if we need any resources. So there's a, a pretty big step forward in terms of the tool chain and our understanding of how to use all the things that are available to us. What's working right now in the lab for the ZC706 and the ADRV9009, that's the combination of development tools or hardware that we have for HIFRIA. The analog devices reference design, this is a hardware uh, descriptive language reference design, HDL reference design that you download. It's uh, open source and you build it. And there are lots of branches, lots. And each of the branches has either uh, a tool chain that it's uh, supporting or a particular variant. Uh, in the case for the Xilinx ecosystem, which is what we're using, the the branches are the tool chain for uh, Vivado, Vitus, Petalinux, uh, and all sorts of other things. So, so when when you look at this ecosystem, all of the things that support the platform, all of the versions have to align. And we've had um, some interesting and significant challenges in this particular regard. So, what we've done for this particular sprint is the 2022.2 branch direct from the HDL reference design uh, repo from analog devices. It made no problem. We're using 2022.2 Vivado, Petalinux, and Vitus from, from Xilinx. Uh, our floating license works fine. We checked it out. We did the build. The platform project for Vitus for the processor side built A-OK. -okay. This, what this uses is the Xilinx system archive design that you export from the HDL build. And we also used sysroot import. So in Petalinux, you can export this entire sysroot. You can import this. This gives you some additional tools uh, that are that are kind of nice for doing cross uh, platform, you know, a cross, com cross compilation. Um, and that is essentially what we're doing. The, the basic idea here is we're doing an embedded design for uh, FPGA and uh, general purpose processor design. The, the most efficient way to do this is cross compilation. This is a complicated cross compilation sort of situation. Uh, so anything that we can do to make it easier, we, we try and do. Uh, all of that stuff eventually did work. Meta ADI is a Yocto layer. If you're not familiar with the Yocto project, it's a really neat open source project that allows embedded uh, platforms um, to kind of abstract away a lot of the the uh, things that, that cause you to uh, spend a lot of time working on. So this is a, a utility layer. And Meta ADI is the the, the repository from analog devices that the Yocto layers are in, we're using the 2022.2 branch direct from the repo. And, um, you know, the further you get up to the application layer, the closer you get to something called live IIO or industrial input and output. And this is a, a very broad library. Uh, it is the one that is used and, and recommended uh, by analog devices to to use with their SDR chips. And we're using LiveIO 0.25. That's the version. Uh, the version of LiveIO locks in your version of the transceiver evaluation software. This utility is the thing that um, that is the thing that produces the configuration profile for the ADRV or the RFIC. OK, so there's a lot here. Um, what I like to do is kind of draw this out as like a Venn diagram <laughs> because it is. Um, 
So you can see kind of the challenge here in, in terms of tool chain and everything has to come together and they all have to work together. If you've been following along, you know that we do have a significant issue along with everybody else. All the commercial customers also have this problem with live IO versions and TES uh, not interacting well or working and playing well with others. When you start pulling in things like MATLAB, HDL coder, or you know any sort of HLS, then you run into additional versioning uh, and version skew issues. So what's been done? We have a processor side cross compiler working. This 2022 recipe worked. Live IIO imports and linking process were not working. We figured out uh, what was going on. You need the right version of the example code as well. There is a significant recent change in August of 2023 going from the 0 0.25, you know, up to this point, it's been a zero level uh, for LiveIO. They're going to 1.0, about time. Uh, but the 1.0 version is a breaking change from all the previous LiveIO versions. So if you accidentally go grab whatever the current version of the example C code for say streaming samples from your ADRV 9009, you just want to do a hello world. There's a significant uh, number of changes in the live IIO uh, input output on the, at the, essentially at your application layer. So if you're writing application code for the ARM processor in the Zinc and you're using the wrong version of live IIO, you'll, you'll have what happened to us. Now, we asked for help from Engineer Zone. We got an answer right away, but it required some interpretation. There was a, it looks like it it was a, uh, a really easy to understand misunderstanding from, from the support side. Uh, we read it over very carefully, looked at what we had posted and realized that we now knew how to proceed and everything was working. You can see the screenshots of things working over the air in uh, Slack. So we got a tone transmit Instead of just getting the loop back working, we went ahead and pressed on and did a tone tra tone transmit. So what we're doing is constructing and transmitting uh, a transmit buffer in IIO. This transmit buffer holds a sine wave at a particular tone. So you have your carrier wave and, and your tone is transmitted some distance away from the carrier. We're trying to, get to go ahead and construct tones that are useful for opulent voice uh, to do a to do a demo for the uplink. We also would like to start transmitting our downlink, not just the uplink, uh, because this this particular platform really is just responsible for transmitting the, the downlink, the DVBS2 broadband signal. So there's a difference here, or anything, cyclic buffers and non-cyclic buffers in the transmitter. So cyclic actually works. That's the, that's, we got that working. Non-cyclic has some weird unexpected on-air behavior. We're not sure if it's because we're overloading the ARM A9 or what, uh, but cyclic is now rock solid, stable, ran overnight, uh, makes a tone. The non-cyclic buffer, which means you have to, you know, cyclic buffer means you write to the buffer once and it transmits over and over and over. So if you have just, you're never gonna change your buffer, your output buffer, that's great. Cyclic. Or, or transitioning between different cyclic buffers would be a natural fit for FSK because you just need to transmit various tones. We'll see what we can do there. Uh, but the only two choices in the transmit buffer setup are cyclic and non-cyclic. Non-cyclic, it needs to be uh, constantly updated. So that's uh, that leads us into like what we're gonna be doing next, which is getting the non-cyclic sorted out and as solid as the cyclic. Um, some other progress. Uh, so other members have been researching the general purpose processor uh, opulent voice code. There's been a lot of progress understanding where the corresponding functions will appear in hardware. So you may have seen there's been some, we're going back through the archive, publishing like some, some, some older uh, uh, documentation on where the code was originally forked from, and there's also been updates to the descriptions of what the code currently does. Uh, there's been some, there's significant changes there. And then the, this, that C++ code, this is all general purpose processor code or ARM code um, with, with volunteers working on figuring out like, okay, we're gonna get this working as a single channel. It's going to be running in the ARM 
on the zinc. So mostly software. What corresponding functions need to be moved to hardware? Moving them one at a time and testing at each step is, is the plan um, for now. All of this is in support of a single channel demo. What we really want to do is deploy the code that we have to a general purpose processor, uh, the ARM processor in the Zinc, and then start moving over functions to the to the FPGA fabric. After that, scaling to our 64 channels. And then that, that demonstration will be uh, a pretty powerful one. Okay. The, the easiest cores block testing in order to have an uplink receiver on the platform, uh, we need a polyphase channelizer. And so we do, we're pretty sure that the test bench, which is automatically generated from the Theseus cores code base is a good indication of the quality. Uh, what we're doing is a deeper dive on the test bench to confirm it's working. We talked a lot about whether or not we should contribute back to this open source code base, a, a better automatically generated test bench or not. And the, the consensus right now is no, we'll just do a deep dive, make sure that the automatic test bench works and move on. So initial tests with the automatically generated test bench look good, but it's not a verification. It doesn't do full coverage or anything like that. So we know that so far, uh, making absolutely sure it's doing what we think it's doing uh, is good. The reason for the concern is because the automatic code generation is a relatively new feature in Theseus cores. Our experience is with manually configured code. And the last time that we had this working over the year was 2019. And we demoed it at DEF CON. The polyphase channelizer integration, so taking this code base, these IP blocks that stand alone and do a channelizer, putting it into the, um, the reference design from analog devices for the 9009, that's, there's progress that's been made on that. We documented about how we've incorporated IP into the reference design in the past, like the COBS decoder, the DVB-S2 encoder, and the FPGA cores functions that's uh, utility functions that Swato's written. So the channelizer integration is the next thing to do and then document. Moving forward, how to do the non-cyclic buffer transmit without completely bogging down the RMA9 on the ZC, sorry, 706, and then construct the buffers for the four tones of opulent voice and figure out how to command those without, again, without bogging down the RMA9 as much as possible in hardware. And the TES software, this utility software from analog devices, we need to get a profile that reduces the sample rate down from 128, 122 megahertz to something a bit more reasonable for the for the demos. We'll need to be able to to handle profiles anyway. Uh, so now is a good time to start working that into the uh, workflow. So we have had a lot of work submitted to uh, the ESA. So directly to the ESA, and also uh, working with these organizations here on this slide. There is an European Space Agency Geosynchronous Satellite Study Initiative with some funding, and we we are really happy to see this. So it's an amateur radio intended sort of uh, study initiative, ESA-centric. Um, we have reached out to AMSAT Canada, a brand new organization, AMSAT UK, JAMSAT, AMSAT DL, and we've also provided all of our technical support package and our, our high for IEA design directly to the ESA to let them know uh, what we're up, up to. So this process is ongoing. Uh, everybody's been working on their, their position papers or their submissions where we have been included in the AMSAT Canada. AMSAT UK is very excited and asked if we would like to be quoted. And I said, yes, so we're, we expect that we'll be included there. JAMSAT's talking about this at their next board meeting. AMSAT DL acknowledged receipt of the of the technical support, asked some clarification questions. And and I've, I've just, I've checked in with Frank at ESA to make sure he got our uh, submissions and, and materials. The next activity on this funded initiative from the ESA will be at a commercial satellite conference in September of 2024 called the World Satellite Business Week. It's in Paris. Um, and I went ahead and entered or submitted kind of a, 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 this is very early in the process, but it said we would be interested in speaking. And I'm, I think doing that 
it, just in case if if the ESA simply says no, uh, we're not interested in including you, then we can still uh, pitch our our designs and show what we've done and how open source uh, improves things for uh, both non-commercial and commercial satellite. Um, it looks like a, a, a good target uh, in September of 2024. All right, so our celebration, uh, I'd like to highlight what we've done is really great news. So we've been able to switch from the 9371 uh, platform, which is really great, and the 9009 is very similar in capability. Uh, then the reason why they switched uh, chips is because the 9371 did not get the uptake um, in the marketplace the way that that uh, analog devices or anybody else expected, but the 9009 has. And we are, again, dealing with a very complex base station class radio. It's non-trivial. This is a big challenge. But we're using it to make modern, innovative, and powerful designs, and we're now able to command it. We've figured out... Uh, a lot of the basics uh, for for all the tool chain stuff that that uh, that we opened the presentation with. We are participating actively in the process. Our feedback to MathWorks and ADI has been heard and acted upon, and will be acted upon more in the future. So, I'm looking for the things that that are that are in the works to come about that will make our life much easier in terms of dealing with these various software companies. And uh, we we have been told directly that we have improved their products by giving our feedback and by trying so hard. So that's on the the technical side. Our our regulatory work about open source is also making a difference. So we're starting to hear uh, more about our recent efforts in in terms of regulatory comments and and activity. So this is cause for celebration and and should be highlighted and and the, everybody that's helping us to do these things. Thank you so much. Very few groups are doing this. There, there's a reason. Things worth doing are rarely easy. None of this is easy. Uh, it's uh, We're doing advanced telecommunications work. And we're also doing it open source. Um, and we're doing it with the volunteers. So it's all basically turned up to maximum difficulty. And we're succeeding. It is hard. Uh, and there's the, the the achievements that we've that we've been able to uh, to book are are worth recognition and and celebration. So uh, thanks. It's uh it's coming along. We'll just keep at it. And the over the air demos are the focus. So it doesn't work until it works. It doesn't work until it works over the air. That's uh that's what we'll just keep doing. Goals for the next meeting. So next week are to continue to demonstrate to continue to document and to continue to participate. All right, that's the presentation, all of the stuff that I have for this week. I'm going to stop sharing and then I'm gonna turn the floor over to everybody that's here uh, for our for a round table and comment um, about HIFAR-IEA, about our, our space transponder and, uh, and any questions that anybody has uh, or any complaints if you need something, a resource, if you have a roadblock, that sort of stuff. All right, so I'll start, I'll go ahead and start with Paul. Um, thank you very much for all of the help. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, the, if, you, if you have anything to add or correct, uh, now's the, now's a great time. Well, sorry, I was uh, tuned in a little bit late. I get sidetracked by another project and forgot that I was due on this meeting. So I don't know what's already been covered, but uh, mostly what I've done uh, this week has been helping Michelle uh, trying to switch over to the 9009 radio. And we had some success with that and more success still remains to be had before we can declare victory on, on actually pushing samples out to the radio from the processor. Uh, so that's, that's probably about all I had to report. Yeah. I think a lot of, um, what we need to do coming up really quick is is a is a re not refactoring but like a reassessment maybe of the assumed architecture. Uh, my my gut is that the 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 arm on the zinc is is capable of maybe less than we assumed. We are already assuming it was very high level, only in charge of a few things, um, but judging by the results from top yesterday 
we need to be very parsimonious about the arm and only give it top level management stuff that we you know the sort of bias towards moving everything uh, as much as possible into the hardware might <laughs> might be might might not be a a general bias but like a, it might be a necessity um so uh, yeah, we, we learned definitely learned to be cautious about using the processor resources on the other hand what we're trying to do right now is sample level processing and that clearly was never going to be the processor's job so there's still a chance it'll it'll have all the horsepower it needs to do what we were hoping yeah good point yeah th well thank you and uh looking forward to to next week where we should have even more all right ken i i hope i captured your your input and questions and progress is there anything that needs to be corrected no um yeah just uh trying to understand the transition between the you know we have a a single single channel implementation in software and trying to understand that so that we can map that to hardware blocks right now okay is there is there anything that that you need i know that you have all the documents that we have but is there anything else that 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 you need for the next, uh, like from here until Tuesday? No, I might meet with Paul uh, to discuss uh, like some of these uh, binary uh, file formats, see how I can crack those open for understanding the uh, test bench, but uh, that's about it. Is that on Theseus course? Yeah, the Theseus course test bench has a series of binary uh, stimulus. And so interpreting that and being able to like visually look at the the file other than it's being, I can see it as it's played back, but like if we were to change it, how would I go in and uh, pre present a, a different stimulus? Because one of the things we discussed is uh, you know, marching a tone across the uh, the different channels. So I've got to, I've just got to be able to work with that file format. I don't, don't quite understand it yet, but I'll, I'll get there. Yeah, I will be happy to try to help you figure that out, but I do not know anything about that file format either. I haven't looked at the Theseus cores. Okay, we'll put it on the list. And the the authors are are on our Slack, and they're super helpful so if there's if there's any place where we get stuck on on something like that we can reach out for help okay yeah thank you so much for your help it's a uh, very very appreciated <laughs> make some progress all right and off to anshul hello anshul all right any questions comments or or anything uh, that you need to know Oh, all good. Uh, that's good to know. Uh, that was a good breakthrough, and I'm trying something similar. So uh, everything is checked into the Git. It will be the code for. Uh, actually, this is a good question. So for the working with Vitus, Vitus, um, Vitus sounds like it might be an an irritating skin condition, but Vitus it's a, sounds like Vittles to me for food. So Vitus, when you have a project, I think you can just export the project like you can in Vivado, and that exported project is probably the right thing to upload to Git. In the past, all I've done is like taken the actual C code, like the the, the C code file, and then make sure that that's uploaded because most IDEs require all sorts of setup and ours is even worse because it's cross compilation. So when I go to check in all this work that we've been doing, I mean, it, you can see it's a massive platform, everything from the HDL creation and the bit file and, and everything is version specific. Like what, how should I accomplish, accomplish that? What's the best, what's the best way to, to check it into the repo? Uh, the code files need to go in. If you just uh, check in the project file, it, it will just contain the configuration, uh, which won't be much helpful. Mm, so like like um, we have 
phase two DBBS two, what, what, whatever uh, project, um, whatever the code, whatever the branch that you have checked out, it, it needs to be pushed to the kit so that when I clone, I get the correct code base right in the first step along with the project files. And I can just um, open uh, the ID and point it to the project file and then everything should be ready. Okay. That's, that's the best way yeah, to do it. Uh, if, if you don't push the uh, code files, then it, it, it won't be helpful. Yeah, okay. That's, that's something that's mm -hmm. That I've seen in the past. Okay, so I will uh, up my mm -hmm. game and make sure that the the all the configuration that the mm -hmm. that the export includes all the stuff, and I'll and I'll also write down anything that isn't automatically there. Because um, mm -hmm. I've noticed that the, all the versions for at least the pro, like the IDE side, like the process, the PS side, all the versions mm -hmm. of all the tools actually are captured in the project file from from Vitus. Yeah. But that means that you also have to kind of know that the XSA and the the bit file and all that mm. they have to also have to be produced, and I think they're all included in the XSA. So if the if the if the system archive is included in the export of the Vitus project, then we're I think we're good. Then you should have all the artifacts that you need. You don't have to recreate it all from scratch or use Petal Linux in any way. Mm -hmm. That'd be my goal. Like if that if that's the way. If if that works well enough, then then I then I can do that. So you mean uh, by artifacts, you mean the built artifacts? If I have to build it myself, then yeah, yeah, like the yeah. yeah, the XSA file and the bit file, are, you know, they're large ish, but like you know, I think they're included in the um, I think they're included when you export from Vitus when after you've built a platform and you have yeah, all of they, that stuff included then when you export that from from Vitus then it captures everything that would be there is an option there is an option if you want to ah, use the big okay. file or not yeah yeah okay i'll try it and then if it if it, if i don't get it right then we'll we'll get it right and then that stuff should hmm. should and that should capture the version information so mm -hmm. okay yeah i can do that very mm -hmm. good okay Okay, so yeah, uh, that's what, uh, and apart from this, I was, I, I have traveled back to India, so this week was mostly traveling, but whatever time I got, um, I have been working on getting the receiver and all receiver thing, uh, trying to go through the docs, and also working on this ADI example that you just mentioned about, but I am trying on trying it on AD, ADI 9371 instead of 9009. So it will be good if I can get it working over there. Yeah, but, yeah, it's similar. Yeah, yeah. There's uh, similar, yeah. yeah, it is. It's it's a very, very capable chip. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Is there is there anything, um, I mean, you have the floor, so uh, uh, any, anything else? Uh, just, uh, just that. Uh, I might reach out to again Paul again uh, to understand the C code that he has written for receiver um, for ARM core before, because uh, even I want to take that approach before moving on to FPGA. I want to see the results on the general purpose CPU and see how how, how bad the performance is. You, you, ha you, you have shared the number that, that's super helpful. But with one or two channels, I want to see how bad the performance is, then and then move move on to the FPGA to scale it further. Okay. Yeah. Right. Cool. Yep. That's and all. Then, yep. And then and then hello, Mike. Mike says nothing for me, just lurking. And um, thank you very much for attending. And and uh, please, uh, you, with your experience and expertise, it would be wonderful to get any feedback uh, from you or advice. Uh, so please feel free to weigh in any time. Um, and then hello, hello, Rick. Any uh, any comments, questions, or uh, or feedback for us? Uh, well, well, only that Thursdays. Uh, I notice you've been having some meetings on Thursday mornings. Uh, are really tough because I have a ham radio breakfast every Thursday morning at nine o'clock, and. Well, it's the very closest place you could possibly eat to my house. It's still 20 minutes away. <laughs> so 
I rushed to get back to see what you were doing. And it seems like you're making some progress. That's encouraging. Yeah, no, it is. It's nice to when when um you know the uh when the efforts kind of pan out and you you're able to make some forward progress. I think we'll we'll be able to to start uh demonstrating some some fundamental things now that we've got a lot sorted out. Um yeah, I don't think we'll we don't meet regularly on Thursdays, but we we did uh, mainly because of some some uh, uh, schedule constraints for Tuesdays. So it, please expect us to at least meet on Tuesday and and um, and maybe next week also on Friday. Yeah, it's good. I've I've enjoyed following your progress. Um, oh well, thank you. <laughs> I'll be able to do, uh, parallel some of that one of these days if I ever get some of this stuff off of my bench so I can do my own work or work I would like to do instead of work I'm being paid to do. Yeah, understand. Yeah, we'll document as much as we can. And uh, yeah, what we try very hard to do is make it as accessible as possible. I'm a little Remember? disappointed in your comment about the the uh, ARM processor on the zinc. Um, as not being able to do as much work as you had hoped. Um, that hasn't been my experience, but I haven't tried challenging it that much. So I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, pa Paul did correct me to like say that that we are we are setting it up for kind of a worst case where it has to do a bunch of calculations per sample at 122 megahertz. That's kind of hard. And it did it sort of, you know, so we're we're looking at we're we're setting it up for for kind of a tough uh, corner case. Um, I see. Yeah, uh, we're we're still yeah. getting we're still getting a signal. And, you know, when we we backed off a little bit and set up a, 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 a pre-calculated buffer, uh, even at that default, pretty high uh, sample rate, you know, without doing any interpolation and not treating it very well and handling everything. Uh, in software, it still it still it worked. So, so it was uh, it it was kind of like a a, a bit of an unfair uh, test for it. But it 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 it's a uh, it's good. You know, it's an A nine. We're a lot of us are familiar with the capability. We should be able to do everything that we want to do. Um, it it uh, but it but it is an arm. You know, it's a dual core arm, so there's uh, oh. there's limits to its capability. Have they not yet come out with the four core arm versions? Yeah, we have um, another. So the the sitting right next to it on the bench is uh, an Ultra Scale Plus, which is the quad core A53 processor. Yeah. So we're using that for the drone project for Neptune, and we're we're using the ZC706, so a dual core A9 for the uh, for this one um yeah it probably won't make any difference unless you can split the math up between cores which is not easy no it isn't that is not easy that is a big computer science challenge um yeah I've, that's that's one of the problems i have here with my general purpose computer i've got a 32 core machine but getting some of the processing to use more than one core at a time is sometimes a challenge because a lot of the software guys don't know how to program for that. Right. Yeah. Porting code um, for multi-core is a, an ongoing challenge and not every algorithm, not every calculation can be uh, distributed that way. So, well, we, you know, just, just in our little corner of the world, we also have that that challenge here, uh, properly splitting it up, not just between the FPGA and the general purpose processor. That is the one of the fundamental challenges in SDR in general is an underutilized FPGA and an overburdened GPU. You see that a lot in in uh, off the shelf SDRs. So we have that balancing act to do, but we also have a balancing act within the GPU within the general purpose processor between because they're all at least dual core. So there's challenges all the way around and. What I just said probably is like six different papers, you know, so, yeah, so yeah. it will it will be it will be a challenge moving forward. Well, there's also a unfortunate temptation to avoid doing 
uh, doing things the right way because they're hard. And what I mean by that, uh, a lot of the work I did in the past, uh, we used uh, fixed point math, not floating point, which meant you had to keep track of your exponents as you went along or you would get very bad results. And that's hard. But the, the, if you do things that way in the fabric, you can make things like multiply accumulates very, very fast compared to the, the GPU doing that kind of work or even doing it in the fabric with real numbers, which makes it easy. You know, I triple E 64 bit numbers, but it's very inefficient. Uh, but to do that kind of work means good programmers working at the uh, lowest levels uh, of programming. And we're so used to just drag and drop and a few lines of C or Python and we're done, you know. And that doesn't take advantage of the hardware to its fullest extent. That's true. That's one of the major reasons why we spent so much time trying to get HDL coder to work. Um, because it has an excellent fixed point conversion function in there. And uh, if you set it up correctly, it produces very efficient HDL implementations. All right. I think that's uh, yeah. that's probably a really good point to leave on and, uh, and let everybody uh, get on with the rest of their day. We will most likely meet again on Tuesday, uh, this, this coming Tuesday. And we're also going to try to set up a a Friday uh, office hours to kind of catch up for other technical issues. Uh, any last comments or thoughts or questions or action items uh, before we close? Okay, everybody, thank you so much for your time. It's uh, deeply appreciated. Uh, time once you spend it, you can't get back. So it's precious, uh, very appreciated. And we'll just keep plugging along and doing what we're doing and adjusting as we go. And uh, look forward to some some on the air uh, activity uh, to be shown off uh, next week. All right, thanks everybody. See you soon. Uh -huh.